Good afternoon to everybody, and let me thank the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, it's a long trip from Italy, but I'm very happy to be in companion of my friend, the European. So today we are having a small section on uh, something which is European and Italian. I don't want to say that Italy is not in Europe, but there is some differences between European organized crime as a general framework and what I'm going to say about Italian organized crime. And this is the main reason why I changed a little the title of my presentation which in the beginning was Changing Patterns of Italian Organized Crime, Introducing the Word European. We need to believe that uh, we stay in a very uh, quite strict framework today in Europe, dealing with 27 countries where a lot of legislation is produced toward economic and organized crime. And uh, legislation is one of the two factors that is changing the pattern of organized crime. Criminals are reacting against those who we find as remedies against them. So more it's becoming European, more organized crime is also changing. The second factor that is changing organized crime are opportunities. And more and more in Europe without borders, opportunities are exploding. So um, if 20 years ago I was presenting only Italian organized crime, today I need to introduce Italians and European. But why discussing changing patterns? Uh, as a researcher, I really believe that uh, we need to monitor what is changing in the area of organized crime for uh, uh, one reason. The reason is that uh, one policy that could be very effective in one time is not effective after two or three years. And we run the risk to believe or leave on photos. Sometime we leave on archaeology of the organized crime. We live on very old concepts and paradigms. And if we still believe that things go as they were, we commit many, many mistakes. I can quote a couple of mistakes that are coming from these old paradigms. In the 1965, many tribunals in Italy were believing that organized crime was very, very local. And the main assumption then was let us move the big bosses from the local reality, from the territories, and put them somewhere else. And a law was passed in the parliament that was moving these big boxes and sending to the north part of Italy. This was a very criminogenetic law because this law produces what we call a nationalization of organized crime. They went there. They set up a lot of business in the north part of Italy. And if today we do have a lot of organized crime also in the north part of Italy, this law gave a, a great contribution. The second mistake, uh, or could be one of the many mistakes we, we have done without knowing what is going on, was done when we speak about human trafficking. If we don't understand what is changing in the patterns of human trafficking, we could make a lot of mistakes. Today, we believe that many women are trafficked and many, many women become prostitutes because they were trafficked. This could be so, but we don't look to the new phenomenon when these women become private entrepreneurs and they don't need anymore to be protected they are in the streets of Europe, many European countries, and they earn their own money, selling themselves, and in many cases, many countries give money to protect these people, and they add the money coming from the state to the money coming from clients. Well, this is the second mistake, but we can add a lot of different mistakes. What I'm saying today is the following. If we don't understand what is changing in the patterns of organized crime, we could really have some mistakes in our policies. And this is really relevant because I'm very happy to address to policymakers and practitioners today 
And I learn from their experience a lot of things that come inside my research activity. Let me uh, say what I'm going to say this afternoon in my 40, 45 minutes of presentation. I will focus on uh, European organized crime. I will try to outline the geography of organized crime in Europe. And uh, after, I will focus on the three main criminal organizations that we do have today in Italy. And uh, I will do both uh, interpreting these two areas of my presentation toward, together with uh, the main policies which have been produced in Europe and in Italy in combating disorganized crime. And I will do that also in order to uh, outline the future. What, uh, if there are new uh, emerging patterns of organized crime, I will be very happy to draw some lines on the future. What is going to happen? What will be the main conditions in order to have or not to have organized crime? Well. Let me uh, say, uh, uh, not Europe. Not Europe, uh, um, Denmark, Estonia, uh, Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Sweden. What we do find in these countries is small criminal organizations living mainly on the borders with Russia, where there is the real big organized crime, which is influencing the composition and the structure of these organized crime groups. The market is mainly a drug market, and uh, the organizations which are working there are mainly structured as a small gangs. Uh, let me say, once again, these, these criminal organizations are staying on the borders with Russia. Still, in Northern Europe, we have a forms of extortion which are varying from one organization to the other, but still it's really not what we can call systemic extortion. I am drawing this material from a report I've done for the European Commission on extortion in Europe, where extortion is one of the indicators of the structure of organized crime. Those groups which do commit extortion have some relevance in the inside organization. The other groups who are not committing extortion have another kind of flexible structure and organization. Let me move to Western Europe. Uh, Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Ireland, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, United Kingdom. This is really... Uh, uh, there is a big infrastructure and transport system that facilitated the activities related to organized crime. Drugs, trafficking, counterfeiting are the main activities which are covering on this area. And uh, the influence of Eastern organized crime is quite heavy, especially coming from old Yugoslavia and Balkans. But mainly, these organized crime groups are structured in a way that are borders or cross-border organized crime, which is a, a slightly different concept between transnational and uh, uh, local. It's cross-border organized crime. Uh, once again, extortion racketeering is, uh, does not represent a very big phenomenon here. And uh, Western Europe uh, is mainly on the center of uh, East and West markets, uh, especially crossed by drug trafficking. Let me go to the Central Eastern Europe. Now we have really Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Romania. This is really well-established organized crime, which is coming from the fragmented of Yugoslavia, uh, partially with some influence of the Southeast Asia. And uh, for a long time, this area of countries has been influencing uh, human trafficking to Italy through Albania, for example. No more today. And uh, if you look to uh, uh, Romanian organized crime groups and Bulgarian, these are really producing a lot of problems, especially to the other Western European countries.
Well, now we arrived very fast to South Europe. And Cyprus, Greece, Italy, Malta, Portugal, and Spain, it's always very, very difficult to group and to put in a cluster different countries such as these ones. Is a uh, heterogeneous, uh, different activities, different situations, uh, and uh, uh, different structures operating uh, uh, in these countries. Uh, in Spain, we have some collusions between organized crime and terrorist groups, which does not appear in other um, countries on the area. Uh, in uh, uh, relation to Cyprus and Malta, we do find some case of uh, extortion or uh, partially uh, related to some local groups. Well, let me go to the focus of what is happening in Europe in relation to the uh, response to organized crime. And I will uh, uh, look piece by piece uh, to the following instruments. Interception of telephone conversation, interception of fax transmissions, interception of internet transmissions, audio video recording of events taking place on private premises, undercover operations, techniques of financial investigation, financial criminal analysis. And uh, uh, I will uh, see if uh, and how there are obstacles against this kind of investigations. Through the research we have done uh, for the European Commission, we have been uh, uh, putting out some of the main issues, which are the following. Lack of human material resources within the units specialized in the investigation of extortion racketeering, for example. Limited investigative power. Lack of specialized in investigative units. Lack of legislation. Inadequate follow-up investigation techniques. And I will give now the maps of where these obstacles are in Europe. Uh, you can see from this map, oh, the colors are totally different from mine, but not at all is the yellow. Romania, there are no obstacles in Hungary. And after you can find serious moderate brown and low, these are the perceived obstacles against the investigation. And this is the first issue, lack of humanitarian material resources. The data coming from interviews with experts of 27 countries. Of course, you can trust these experts representing the different countries, but this perception has been asked to stay on some factual indicators. And uh, you can understand in which way the European Union is trying to help countries who have or who does not have these kind of problems. <laughs> this is a limit, limited investigative power, perceived obstacles against the investigation, limited investigative power. Yellow don't have, not at all, don't have this kind of things. Low, moderate, serious. We do have fragmented legislation in Europe. Not all the countries have the same legislation. And this is the results of this map. 